Hey everyone, I'm Raif Darazi, and in this video, I have the great pleasure of interviewing our special guest, Paul Edmonds, otherwise known as the City of Hope patient. We'll get to hear about Paul being cured of HIV, his successful leukemia treatment, what the whole process looked like, and get to know him on a personal level as well. We are currently in Novato, California for the annual HOPE Collaboratory Conference, a meeting of all the scientists around the world working on the block, lock, stop modality of preclinical research for an HIV cure. Specifically, we are at the beautiful Buck Institute, which focuses its research on aging, including aging with HIV, as part of their spectrum of research. Paul, it is so great to have you on. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm great. Great. Glad to be here. And um, okay, so this is a question I ask a lot of my guests. Um, just in general, what is your personal assessment of the global HIV AIDS epidemic? Well, um, you know, I, globally, you know, we need to work on access for treatment, uh, make that better and affordable for everyone in the world. Uh, and the same thing when working on a cure, you know, make it approachable for everyone. Um, so um, I think there's a, a lot, lots to do. And you are the fourth person cured? Actually, I'm the fifth. You're the fifth? Yeah. You're the fifth person who cured yeah, HIV? Yeah, no, that got all mixed up <laughs> in reporting. Uh, oh, okay, and, yeah, uh, I noticed yeah, that there yeah. were different numbers on, on, yeah, on the media. I'm number five. So you are the fifth person cured of HIV, or what is sometimes referred to as functionally cured of HIV. How does that feel? Well, it feels, feels great, I think. I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to uh, believe it. Mm -hmm. I still have to pinch myself every once in a while and say it's real, but um, yeah, it felt great. Wonderful. Okay, before we d dive deeper into your HIV and cancer diagnoses and your experiences receiving treatment, um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you personally. Um, where are you from? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Tacoa, Georgia. It's a small town uh, about an hour and a half northeast of Atlanta. Okay. That's where I grew up. Yeah. And what brought you out to, because now you're living in Palm Springs, correct? Right, right. Well, I moved to San Francisco in 1976. Okay. So, What brought you out there? I, um, well, I, I came out and accepted uh, my, my, uh, that I was gay, and uh, I headed to San Francisco. It was mm -hmm. the place to go at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's different these days. You can really um, kind of live almost wherever you are near a metropolitan city and, and find a gay community. Right. But I imagine maybe it was a little different than... I, well, I think it was, and a lot of people were moving to San Francisco then. Yeah. Uh, and had that reputation for being the gayest city in the country at the, the time. Um, okay, now moving into your cancer diagnosis, when did you find out that you had leukemia? Uh, well, I found out I had MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome, mm. in June of 2018. Uh, I, my HIV doctor sent me to a hematologist uh, because uh, all of my labs were off. And they changed in a three-month period, uh, and mm. everything was off. Uh, and he did a bone marrow biopsy and di diagnosed me with the MDS. And uh, I told him that I was thinking of moving to Palm Springs at the time. I had bought a condo there, and uh, he told me about City of Hope. Uh, the doctor in San Francisco wanted me to start uh, on chemo right away within a couple of weeks. So I went home that day, I Googled City of Hope and called them, got an appointment and went down within a week and uh, decided to uh, you know, go with them. Uh, and, and my doctor there suggested you know, that I might want to think about not starting chemo yet because I really wasn't having any symptoms, uh, some fatigue. But otherwise, it was just my labs all being uh, off. And can you can you explain for those who aren't aware what MDS is? Uh, it, it can often be a precursor to uh, leukemia. Mm. Uh, not always, I guess, but often it is. Mine turned out it was. Mm. But I was going to say, uh, um, when I came down uh, to City of Hope, well, what happened after I, I went to City of Hope, uh, about a month later, almost exactly a month later, uh, my doctor called to tell me they had found a donor, and the donor had uh, the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. And I kind of didn't expect them to find that because it's so rare. Mm. But uh, So that was uh, thrilling, to say the least. So I, I moved down uh, in October to uh, Palm Springs, 
and City of Hope started a, a workup for about a week before the transplant, and that's when they discovered that it had uh, progressed to uh, AML, uh, acute myeloid leukemia. I see. And what does that affect specifically? Or where is the cancer in the body? Yeah, in your blood. In your blood, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's and a that, blood that affects cancer. affects the bone marrow as well? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and so I take it that you you already had HIV when you discovered the cancer. Right, Cause right. Because you were going getting your labs? Yes, I, I, uh, I tested, I got tested and got a, uh, an AIDS diagnosis at pretty much the same time. Mm. Uh, in 1988, uh, my T cells were uh, around 50, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. Although I wasn't sick. Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah. that they gave me that AIDS diagnosis because of that low T cell count. Yeah. And so, so at the time, it wasn't necessary to have a, an AIDS-related complication. Well, no, they were counting the T cell count. It dropped under 200, I think. Okay. That's uh, the number. And back then, they didn't have the medications that most of us are familiar oh, no. with today. The, well, uh, that was the height of the, the epidemic. Right. In the beginning, it was just uh, the ACT. That's what I started with. Uh, they had, uh, before I started ACT, they had decided to drop the dose, dosage, and they cut it in half. Mm. And I think maybe that's why I might have survived, because I lost a lot of friends, I think, because the ACT was so toxic. You know, you're not the first person that I've spoken to who said that they yeah. they personally decided to, to drop the dosage and that that might have contributed to yeah. the success. So, and then other things started coming along, uh, things that I remember. I don't even know how many different HIV drugs I've been on. Um, I could figure that <laughs> out, but <laughs> uh, DDC and DDI come to mind. They came along next, I think, after the ACT. In the 90s? Uh, then, well, that might have been 89 or 90, okay. I would say. Um, all those drugs were really bad. They, they pretty much kept me feeling sick yeah. most of the time. Yeah, alive but so, sick. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, can ima I, can't, I, mean, I can't imagine because even in 2012 when I was diagnosed and was put on the tripla, that was, that was horrendous on my body. Yeah, it, it's... It's a shock, I think, to our systems. So yeah. Things did improve, though. Uh, you know, proteus inhibitors changed everything. You know, they were kind of rough in the beginning, but they quickly got better. And initially, I believe it was like a one-drug approach, and then was the protease inhibitor like the, the second component? Right. I mean, that makes me think of Norvir uh, and... Uh, I think when I started taking Norvir, and now they, use, they started using Norvir as an add-on drug. Uh, I think when I started taking it, it was, I was taking it not as an add-on, and it was a pretty rough drug to mm. take yeah. in that high of a dose. Yeah. So does your particular kind of cancer that you had, um, is that what qualified you to be able to have this stem cell transplant? Well, yes, yeah. That was... You know, I mean, I, I could have opted to have, uh, I mean, I had to do something or I, I would not have survived. So I didn't have to think too hard about deciding whether to do that or not. Yeah. But I mean, I could have opted. I know people who have had leukemia who just had the chemo and not the bone marrow transplant. And, mm. uh, yeah. and you did both? I, I did both, mm. yeah. yeah. But in order to do the bone marrow transplant, they want to, the leukemia to be in remission. Mm. So that took three different kinds of uh, chemo mm. for that to happen over about three months. Well, wow. I was in the hospital five months. And, you know, I, I didn't know what the chemo was going to be like. Um, and I expected it to be pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Really? Yeah. yeah. Not as bad as just some of the medications that I've dealt with. Wow, over the year. okay. You know. So you had something to <laughs> compare to. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's fortunate. Yeah. So for folks watching, um, Paul received a stem cell transplant from a donor with a rare genetic mutation, also known as homozygous CCR5 Delta 32, 
mutation and I believe it's prevalent in only one to two percent of the population worldwide so it's an extremely rare mutation um, and he was fortunate enough to have access to that and I, I get a lot of questions from community asking oh great we have a we have a cure so can we all, can everybody do this can everybody just get this stem cell transplant no. and then be cured yeah no uh, no, no. It, it because there's uh, so many risk involved uh, with it until they don't want to do it unless you know you're at this place where that's kind of the only thing you can do yeah but um, yeah it's, it's not for everyone but but hopefully the science will uh, the things that are learned from it will exactly. create something that's everyone for yeah. everyone yeah so. so to be so to be clear and, and to sort of reiterate what Paul is saying, um, the risks that are inherent in the procedure are so high that it, it's not recommended for the general population. And in someone like Paul's case, where they're facing possible death because of cancer, it's there's a risk, there's a cost benefit weighing that has to be done. And in his case, it, it was worth it to to take that shot. Yeah. And it turned out Absolutely. well. Absolutely, it sure did. <laughs> <laughs> and you, getting back into your personal life a little bit, you've okay. been with your partner Arnold for thirty-one years. Over a little over thirty-one. Uh, over yeah. over thirty-one our, our years. Our last now. anniversary, February, will be thirty-two. Amazing. <laughs> How did you meet? We met at Happy Hour at the Midnight Sun. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the Midnight Sun? Midnight Sun's a bar in San Francisco in the Castro. Cute. Right? Been there a very long time. Amazing. Was there when I got here in '76, mm. but not in the same spot. Yeah. And wh what is your secret to a long-lasting relationship? Well, those of us want to know. <laughs> well, you know, we we're normal. We've had our ups and downs, but we 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 for a long time we we worked uh, we work as a team and we try to be honest and open with each other. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, we, we work together, but we also uh, uh, don't lose our own identities. I think that's kind of important, too. That, so yeah. you kind of have the permission and the freedom to be, your, be yourself? Right, yeah, absolutely. Have your own hobbies and likes? And yes, yes. Like Arnie, Arnie does acting, and, uh, you know, that's definitely not my thing. But, <laughs> but he's very good at it. I love seeing him act. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I paint. Uh, Arnie paints some too. And does Arnold also have HIV? Yes. Okay. Yes, he does. Yes, he got tested at, when we met in 1992. Uh, he had not been tested, and we talked about it. And he decided it was best to know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got tested, and he was positive. Um, uh, he's he's undetectable. Uh, we also had uh, his strain of HIV. He has HIV one, so I'm immune to that. Um, so. Great. And um, was that a source of comfort in a way to to have someone who understands you and what you're going through as well? Well, yeah. Support each other. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we we've kind of uh, all these years we've done it together, and you know. Um, mm -hmm. My um, boyfriend is negative. Um, I'm also undetectable. So fortunately these days, you know, once you're undetectable, you're untransmittable. And right. he, can, he still supports me. Um, he's there for me as well. And we don't really have to worry about it either. Okay, I wanted to ask, what is that dynamic like now that you are cured of HIV? Um, your partner is living with HIV. I feel like when in life we're afforded wonderful opportunities, amazing opportunities. You're now functionally cured. We want to be able to take our partners along with the ride, on the ride with us. Does that dynamic impact your advocacy work now? Basically, I'm, I'm, I just want to know, you, you being cured and Arnie is living with HIV, right. knowing that between you and your relationship, does that um, motivate the work that you're doing now as far as pushing oh. for, you know, Cure research and funding and uh, well, well, of course it, it does. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I really want to see a cure for everyone. You know, I would love to see Arnie cured of HIV. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, and, and then on the other hand, it it, it hasn't changed things a whole lot for us because uh, on a practical level, on a practical level, yeah.
Well, that's, I mean, that's a testament to how far we've come. Absolutely. Okay, so you ha I read that you had a strong resilience and optimism, uh, hopeful hopefulness for the outcome of your cancer treatment. Tell me about what you were thinking, what you were feeling as you were getting preparing for it, going through it, where and where does all that resiliency and, and a positive outlook come from? Well, it, it, I think it comes from the all of my years of having HIV. I mean, I've had HIV, you know, my, over 30 years. Uh, you know, I, I never gave up, and I, I still don't. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't necessarily, uh, like, I, I didn't convince myself that I knew this would work. I just kind of uh, let myself go with the flow and uh, trusted in my doctors, and, uh, uh, you know, it all worked out. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, I never, I don't ever give up. Uh, um, but I don't think that's an innate quality. Like, did you have that quality when you were diagnosed with HIV and going through the thick of it? I did. You did? Yeah. yeah. So uh, there was something in you already. Yeah, yeah, obviously. I think I think there was. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, fight her and um, I, I don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> and what was that initial news like when you were told that, that they found a donor for you. Uh, well, the, that was, uh, well, just one of the best days in my life that, yeah. that I can you know, can think of. Did they bring you into the office? Was it a phone no, call? No, it was a phone call because okay. I, I was up here in San Francisco and he was in Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, he called me and told me and, uh, you know, Made my day. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. And what what did the doctors tell you about the stem cell transplant procedure? What was that process like? Well, you know, they told me that it, it had a great risk came with it. You know, told me it could be fatal. Mm. You know, they city of hope. That's the main thing that they do are bone marrow transplants. And I I I knew a number of how many they've done, but. Uh, that's a lot. And like they're one of the leading places in the country doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I imagine that was a, you had a, um, a sit down conversation with Arnie too, and you both kind of yeah. came on to the same agreement, same page. Yeah, I, you know, like I said, I didn't, I didn't have to think about it very much. I just was wasn't ready to die, so yeah. I'm going to do knew. what I needed to do. <laughs> that that's kind of how I've always been. I, I, you know, I, I'm a. I was an Eagle Scout, you know, uh -huh. be prepared, I, you know, I just, uh, I do what needs to be done. Yeah. So that's what I always have tried to okay. do. Okay. I think, okay, because I'm trying to suss out a little bit of like what makes you so successful in that regard. And I'm getting a sense that you, you're not one to overthink and dwell and you are ready to make a decisive action, a decision when needed, when the time calls. Yeah, pretty much. You know, I wasn't always like that. That that's been something I've learned over the years. A lot of that learning's come from my experiences with HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but growing up too, yeah. you know, I was, uh, you know, growing up in that small southern town and was not gay friendly at mm -hmm. all. Um, That'll teach you resiliency, right yeah, there. Sure did. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I can relate because I was definitely, I such an overthinker i mean i still am prone to overthinking well i've had to work at it you know yeah exactly it's been a process you you learn to just you know make yourself stop <laughs> yeah exactly and certain routines help and planning and organizing and things yeah, like that yes so now i want to jump to post-treatment okay. can you talk about what that experience was like when your doctor sat you down and gave you the results well, they, you know, I started getting the results of the HIV test uh, early on. That you know everything was just coming up negative. Uh, you know, they weren't finding anything. So it was I, pretty immediate. Well, the the yeah, uh, testing negative to HIV was, <laughs> was very immediate. They did they didn't say it it you've been cured, but they just, you know they kept me. Breast, uh, yeah. uh, you know, knowing what was going on all the time, and uh, you know, it takes time to the, come the to longer, that conclusion. The longer it goes, the better it gets. Yeah, yeah. So I let's see. 
it's been uh, it's approaching five years since the transplant, mm -hmm. and th approaching three years since stopping the meds, HIV meds. It's pretty conclusive. Yeah, yeah. I think they want us after five years. They're going to say you're cured. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm getting there. So there's like a probationary period, I guess. <laughs> kind of. I think so. Uh, the doctors and I had planned on, s I was going to stop my HIV meds a year after the transplant, but then the pandemic came along, and I really was concerned about that, and uh, I didn't want to do it until I was able to get the vaccine for COVID, mm -hmm. so I waited mm. another year. And is there, like, um, do you have to do follow-ups now? Are they still... Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think probably for the rest of my life, okay. but... Uh, there, I went this, uh, the longest period I had gone was, uh, this last appointment was six months. Uh, but, but I see, uh, you know, I see my infectious disease doctor, I see a dermatologist, mm. uh, and my hematologist. And, uh, so a life not totally unlike those of us right. still on treatment. Right. The life that I've been used to for a long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. You just get a little negative mark on your... Yeah. On your yeah. documents. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, what's what's next in store for you? However you'd like to answer that. Okay. Professionally, personally. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to, uh, Arnie and I are both going to uh, the NIH uh, next month for uh, uh, HIV cure boot camp. Mm. So I'm hoping to learn a lot there. Is that separate from the annual Martin Delaney Collaboratory meeting? It, yes, it's like the day before. Oh, okay. And then we're going to go to that. Okay, so I'll see you there. Oh, okay, great. Awesome. <laughs> and then, then we're, after that, we're going to uh, the uh, RID meeting in Atlanta. Okay. That's the annual meeting for the RID right. cap. Right. Yeah, so that that's what I'm doing with that. And, you know, uh, I'm going to Honolulu when, uh, this Wednesday from here mm -hmm. uh, for the Hawaii to Zero group. Yeah, you're, so you're here with um, Mark Franke, yes. the Dusseldorf patient, for those of you who aren't aware. And then you're going to be both going to Honolulu right. to meet with Adam Castillo, the London patient. Right. Sign up, kind of a, a tour of the three here. Well, this will be the first time the three of us have been together. Fantastic. So, yeah. And do you have a particular objective or goal doing this tour together? No. <laughs> Are you fundraising? Uh, I think Mark has, and Adam have been doing some okay. fundraising in Europe. Gotcha. I, I'm more than happy to work with uh, fundraising or helping with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but so far I haven't done anything yet. Uh, we're, we're all going to be on the stage and do a question and oh, okay. answer as a group, I think. Great. That's the plan. With, with uh, I think Lish will be moderating. Mm. Lish is one of the principal investigators. There are three principal investigators of the HOPE Collaboratory. An investigator is just um, a fancy way of saying researcher. So the, the three main researchers for the Hope Cab. It took me a year to, to learn what an investigator was. <laughs> As a community member, you get thrown in and you, you have all these terms and jargon thrown at you. And that, um, I'm sure as you're diving into the world. It's... Well, exactly, yes. It's, it's lot, lots to learn. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm also on the uh, uh, community advisory board for RID. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and the goal with my channel and what I'm doing is to hopefully be able to share that with the audience and give them little pieces here and there so they can start to learn with us and not feel so disconnected yeah. from the, the science community. Absolutely. Can you offer up any advice for those who are living with HIV who may feel that love relationships are no longer in the cards for them because of their diagnosis? Well, you know, if, 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 if someone... I kind of don't understand why someone would feel that way. But, uh, yeah. I mean, there, are, there are a lot of folks when they're diagnosed, I mean, who still lack proper education. As someone diagnosed with HIV who thinks that they're going to die still or thinks, right. you know, that they can still transmit it or life is going to be completely altered, yeah. especially globally. I mean, yeah. the amount of education okay. and stigma is on another level. And then someone who's negative, I mean, the stigma is very prevalent. Yeah, well, you know, I you know I, I think people just, just need to work on themselves and, uh, uh, you know, whether that's uh, with counseling or whatever, and uh, educate themselves as best they can and seek out information. Mm. Yeah. And, and 
uh, so that hopefully they, they will change how they feel about that over time. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and the, the HIV community is quite supportive. Um, you know, I still, I still very much feel connected to the HIV positive community. I don't As think that will ever change for me. Yeah. You know, it's, it's part of who I am. Mm -hmm. Exactly, I agree. <laughs> Has been more than half of my life. So. Yeah. So it takes a little initiative on the part of yeah. someone living with HIV too. But the resources are, especially with internet and social media, even if you're living somewhere where you don't have local community-based organizations, right. there's so much online, there's so many resources. It does take a little initiative, but it's there. Yes. Before we wrap this up, is there anything you'd like to share or talk about? Well, I, I want to get more involved in my social media accounts. I, I, I'm not, not the greatest person on the computer, but um, uh, I have a Facebook page. I need want to find someone to help me with that, but um, <laughs> you know, I like to do Twitter and X. And, X, uh, as it's now known. And Instagram. Yeah. Um, is your Facebook page, is that public? Uh-huh. And so how can I, I don't know how to make it. I, I wanted to make it like a public figure type page. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to do that. It's just a right. I, I've got my own personal page, and then I created a new oh, you one, did. like a fan uh, page, with with uh, City of Hope. Uh, I'll, I'll we'll connect after this, and I'll mm. see if I can help you with that. Oh, okay. Because okay. <laughs> I have one. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Because um, I, I I'm getting so many friend requests, and of yeah. course I have no idea who anyone is. Yeah. And, uh, it's helpful to separate the personal from the. Yeah. So okay. Uh, so I'll put up. I'll put a link in the description box below to that once we get that sorted. Okay. So I can hopefully drive some people to your page. Okay, great. Okay, that's it. Well, thank you, Paul, for being so open and generous with your time and your energy and sharing a little bit about your personal life. You know, it, it, may, it may seem trivial to talk, talk about some of your personal things, but I think there are so many people I've, I've learned who watch this and they don't have that at all yeah. in their life. And for them, it's like, gold to be able to feel connected to you and to me and to all the research and science that's going on in the world so thank you for that well you're very welcome i, I feel uh, uh, honored to um, be doing this yeah <laughs> everyone else um keep an eye out as i'm going to be interviewing mark franke the dusseldorf patient as well i'll put up a card here as soon as that video is available and you may also watch my previous interview with Adam Castillo, the London patient. I'll put up a card here to that as well so you can watch that. To everyone um, on the other side of the screen, thank you so much for watching. Drop your thoughts, comments, questions below. I'm happy to follow up. Like this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. And please share this with anyone who might find value in this content. That's the best way that you can support me and my channel. Until next time. Cheers. Mm-hmm. <laughs>